Hi guys, welcome back to another video. It's Goffy here and in today's video I want to talk about the M10. If you've been following the channel you'll know that I picked this up a few months ago at this point and prior to owning this camera I owned a Leica M240 for the best part of five years and after owning the camera for five years I decided to sell it and not long after selling it I started to miss it. I held off nearly six months after selling my M240 before kind of clawing my way back to Leica but here we are now. I've got the M10, I've owned it for a few months and I wanna go through a few things today. One of the things we're gonna go through is how am I getting on with the M10? We're also gonna compare the M10 to the M240. And finally, I guess we're just gonna go through why anybody would want a digital M in the first place. One of the main reasons at the minute that I was super interested in getting back to this is the thing that makes this camera what it is, and that is a rangefinder. I think that was the main thing I was missing was the rangefinder experience. And part of that is due to, in both my work life and my personal life, I spend an awful lot of time looking at screens. And a rangefinder is something that kind of separates an awful lot of other cameras out there. Now don't get me wrong, EVFs definitely have a time and place. My Fujifilm X-H2S that I'm recording on now would be absolutely hilarious if it had a rangefinder. But at the same time, this is a camera that would make no sense if it had an EVF. For me, often an EVF when it comes to photography is just literally a physical barrier between me and the real world right in front of me. And having an optical experience helps me connect with the real world around me and leave a little bit of the digital world behind. And I guess if you're just talking about an optical rangefinder like experience, there are definitely alternatives out there. Fujifilm have a whole line of hybrid viewfinder cameras. You can flick between both an EVF and an optical experience as and when you wish. And they do an awfully good job at blurring the lines between digital and optical. I feel though that one of the things that these cameras miss out on is a good manual focus experience to back it up. If you're using one of these Fujis and you use the optical viewfinder, Manual focusing is then super hard. If you want a manual focus, you now need to use an EVF and you then struggle to kind of match this balance between the two. This camera comes in and I think this is the only camera that I've ever used where it perfectly merges that optical and manual experience into one. And it's because of that kind of combination of the two that I absolutely love using this camera and I genuinely get super excited to shoot it even though we're talking about two or three months in at this point. And I haven't seen any spec sheet out there that says how often does it make you want to pick it up. And fundamentally that is a very important part of photography that no spec sheet can tell you. Some of the images that I've taken with this camera, especially candids in just kind of quiet moments, are some of my favorite images I've taken over the last few years. And I've got so many good images just crammed into the last few months. So why then, if I was missing my Leica M240, did I go out and buy a Leica M10? Now I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that part of the reason was just me wanting to experience a different camera. But at the same time, the Leica M240 definitely had its faults. Some of the ones that were starting to kind of annoy me at the time were things like the white balance used to miss frequently, images would often overexpose, the ISO performance was pretty terrible. The boot up time was pretty slow. There's quite a few things that were all building into a camera that as much as I loved the experience, quite often the result wasn't quite what I was looking for. So then how do these two cameras compare? Now as an M240 owner, one thing that I thought I didn't care about the M10 was the fact that the M10 is four millimeters thinner. That four millimeters thinner sounds pretty small, but it makes a pretty significant change to how this camera feels in the hand. This camera feels an awful lot like my M6, whereas the M240 was always noticeably a bit thicker and didn't quite feel the same. There is a downside to the fact though that this body slimmed down by four millimeters, and that is the fact that the battery that goes in this camera is quite literally smaller than the battery that went into the M240. And battery life in this M10 is noticeably worse than it was with the M240. With the M240, I owned it for five years and I only ever used one battery. One battery would easily last me through a day of shooting, so I'd then charge it in the evening and I never felt a need for a second. When I bought this M10, it actually come with a second battery and I frequently find towards the end of the day that I need to use it. Now, I don't think the battery life of this M10 is particularly bad. I think the M240 was actually just exceptionally good. So you kind of have this trade-off. Do you want the slimmer body design or do you want the better battery life? Now, for me personally, I don't mind carrying that second battery around. I think that the kind of gain in how this camera feels to use is more than worth the trade-off in terms of how many shots I can take on a charge. Another thing that I really like about the design of this camera is taking the continuous shooting off of the power button. I used to find with the M240 that I would accidentally flick it into continuous shooting far too often and continuous shooting is just a setting I pretty much never use on an M camera so I'm glad they got rid of it and hid it in the menu somewhere. 
The screen on the rear of the M240 was pretty terrible. To review images and see if they were in focus, I always found that you had to like zoom in to check, whereas this screen on the back of here, although it's still not great by today's standards, is definitely far better. The ISO dial on the top of this camera. I like the idea, but I don't like the implementation. I don't like the fact that you have to like pick it up and then turn it. I would much rather it was just a dial that you could change. However, for me personally, I leave my camera in auto probably 60-70% of the time. And when I am using a manual ISO, I'm somebody that kind of sets and forgets rather than constantly changes the ISO throughout a shoot. The other big design change really is the three buttons on the back. The three buttons on the back of this camera replaced the six buttons on the back of the M240. When I quickly googled an image of the M240 to see how many buttons it had, I was actually surprised it had six. And I couldn't actually remember what the six buttons used to do. One of them was the ISO button, and arguably you don't need that now because it's on the top. And there was other, always two buttons on the M240 that used to confuse me as well. The set and menu button. I used to forget what settings were in each one of those and quite often find myself pressing both. The fact that this has been simplified down to three doesn't cause me any problems at all. And the fact that you've only got three bigger buttons probably means using this camera with gloves on, which we're bound to start doing for me here in the UK now as we're heading into winter, will be far, far easier. When it comes to performance rather than physical features, this camera boots up an awful lot quicker than the M240 did. I don't have my M240, so I can't do a side-by-side -side comparison, but it's definitely quicker. And when it comes to ISO performance, this camera far exceeds that of the M240. I used to find with the M240 that if you hit something like 3200 ISO, things started to get pretty noisy, and beyond that, they were borderline unusable, whereas this camera, even at 6400, images are still looking nice and clean. And one more thing that this camera has that the M240 didn't, that goes a little bit against the analog feel of this camera, is the Bluetooth. I absolutely love the fact that I can very quickly send an image from my camera to my phone to post on things like social media, and Leica also have one of the best apps out there for being able to do that. So for me personally then, I think all of these upgrades more than make up for the fact that this camera is a thousand pound more expensive than the M240. In comparison, I do think that price difference is justified in a mixture of how the camera makes me feel and want to use it in terms of the design and the build, and also in terms of actual literal performance. This is a camera that performs an awful lot better than my M240 did. It's really hard to sit here and talk about a Leica M body without talking about the lenses that go on the front. Now I've owned an awful lot of Voigtlander lenses and I still do, I think I've got five of them at this point, and I think they offer a very good balance of performance, price, and character. However, recently I have been selling an awful lot of camera gear and picking up some Leica lenses at the same time. I picked up three lenses recently and I'm somebody that never really believed in the Leica look. As much as I shot my M240, I didn't really believe this kind of unique look that people talked about. However, recently, especially with the 35mm Summerlux that I've been using over the last couple of weeks, I definitely think the images have a little something that other manufacturers just have never seemed to offer me in the past. But it's super hard to describe and I definitely don't have the technical knowledge to describe what it is about these images up on the screen now, but there's something about them that just feels like there's been a kind of hint of magic added to the mix. When I posted these up on social media last week, somebody actually reached back to me and said, it looks like these are images from like Alice in Wonderland. And I know exactly what they're trying to say, but I find it super hard to describe. But I do know if I shot in this exact same scenario, one of my Fuji cameras, the images just wouldn't have come out looking the same. Whilst I was in Lake Como, I predominantly shot the X-H2S because I knew I wanted that extra bit of reach. But whilst we were kind of near where our Airbnb was, I quite frequently shot both cameras at the same time. And sitting back at home and looking at these images in Lightroom, I definitely prefer the images that come out of the M10. So if you're worrying about the fact that this camera is kind of six years old at this point, and you're worrying about maybe that's gonna affect the performance, if you're pairing it with some of these Leica lenses, this more than keeps up with the best of today. But then away from these kind of genuine Leica lenses, there is a whole world of lenses out there because the M mount has been going on now for nearly 70 years. And at 70 years, there are so many lenses out there. So if you don't like the clean clinical look that these more modern lenses give, there's an awful lot of classic lenses out there that have far more character. And if you're willing to adapt lenses, the amount of lenses that you can use just goes on forever. There's so many lenses out there. And if you're somebody that likes to experiment with that sort of thing, this is a camera that offers so much flexibility in that department. Now the next thing, and this was something that I was conscious of when I owned the M240 as well, is the fact that you can fit a full frame body, a film M, 
and three fast lenses into a Billingham Hadley Small. And that is one hell of a bag when it comes to how much you're packing in such a small space. And I love the fact that the small form factor of these cameras means that something like that is possible. I'm going to Budapest at the weekend and that is going to be the combination I'm taking. I'm going to take the M10, the M6 and three lenses all in a bag that just fits on my shoulder. It is also the first time that I think I've been worried about the value of my gear. So I guess one downside is the fact that I've now gone out and got camera insurance that covers me losing all this gear at once. And I've never really felt the need for that in the past, but one small shoulder bag is carrying an awful lot of money when it comes to gear. And I guess that probably moves us on then to some of the downsides of this camera. Now one of the gripes I had with the M240C was the camera's tendency to overexpose. And the M10 isn't that different. Both of the cameras I think operate on a spot meter and it's more to do with how the spot meter works than maybe a flaw of the camera, but it definitely feels a bit wacky at times. If you're aiming your camera directly at your subject, the camera does not give a second thought about how bright that sky is. There's so many images I've taken over the last few months where the sky is just plain white. Now you can easily avoid that if you use manual settings or what I've been doing more recently is I always permanently have this camera set to a third or two thirds of a stop underexposed. I guess another thing is the lack of weather sealing when it comes to these cameras. Now an awful lot of people will tell you that these cameras are built with weather sealing inside of them and I definitely believe that but the fact that Leica won't endorse that themselves does leave me a little bit skeptical and the value of this gear is something that I just don't want to risk. So if it is raining I do find myself reaching for my X100V because this is just something that I don't want to chuck in the rain if Leica themselves aren't willing to endorse it. I guess another thing as well, and it is due to the fact that this camera is a rangefinder, is the close focusing distance. I've got very used to, over the six month hiatus of a digital M, doing close focusing without thinking twice with the X100V and other Fuji cameras I've been using. But one of the restrictions of a rangefinder is 70 centimeters is the close focusing distance. Now some lenses will let you focus closer, but you have to use the EVF. But from a Leica point of view, that's the modern lenses and they're super expensive. There are some Voigtlanders out there that let you do it, but it's not an experience that really works that well. So I find, especially when it comes to maybe travel photography and I wanna take pictures of say food, drinks, things like that, I definitely feel like I miss out a little bit by having this camera with me and not one of my others. And I guess the other thing that we touched earlier is the fact that the battery life of this camera isn't great. However, at the same time, carrying a second battery isn't the end of the world and it's pretty easy to change the battery in them. And I'm not doing this professionally. It's not like I'm at a wedding where I really need to quickly change a battery. It's something that I can live with if it takes me a few seconds to change the battery. So hopefully then this video has helped answer some of the questions I've been getting frequently. Why did I go back to a digital M? How am I getting on with the M10? And importantly, how does the M10 compare to the M240 that I used for so long? And I'm also really enjoying at the minute using the Leica glass as well. The combination of the M10 and Leica glass definitely is starting to make me a believer of the Leica look. If you've enjoyed this video, then please do not forget to like and subscribe. And if you have any questions about anything you've seen in this video, then please feel free to hit me up down in the comments. But as always, guys, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. Cheers.